everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today, I know every week I say I'm excited, but I'm really excited for this one today. Today, we have with us author Jennifer LeClaire. Now, Jennifer LeClaire, we know her to be a prayer warrior. We know her to be a person who knows about spiritual warfare. And we're going to touch on that stuff. But did you know that she was actually sent to jail? She was facing 10 years in prison. Now, you're going to want to hear how she was vindicated, supernaturally vindicated, and how God can vindicate you for what you've been through in life and how you can rely on God to vindicate whatever's happened to you. Jennifer LeClaire, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. I love your show. love what you're doing. I bless the work of your hands. All right. So a lot of us know you or not know you, but we've heard uh, your, your testimonies. We've heard your teachings. We've read your books. But there is more behind the story. And I always wonder for people who's been in ministry a long time um, with a wonderful track record, you want to know where they come from, right? So could Mm -hmm. we start off where you've been? Were you raised in a Christian home to begin with? Or how did your life look like growing up as a child? No, actually, my parents never took me to church ever. Um, there was a Bible in our home. My grandparents were Christians. That my grandfather's family line was all Baptist deacons. But no, the only times I went to church as a kid, I went to a Catholic church one time with my friends. Didn't like that. Went to a Presbyterian church on a military base. wasn't too fond of that either. So I had no paradigm or grid of Jesus. I never heard the gospel, um, and I think that um, you know that was to my detriment because I had a rocky youth. So what do you mean you had a rocky youth? Well, you know, in my household, my my dad was very angry. My mother was very anxious. You sort of had to walk on eggshells. And it was just like a a fear-based environment. So by the time I was a teenager, I started looking for ways of escape. You know, I started smoking weed and, and, you know, know, doing LSD and taking ecstasy and all the things that were common when I was growing up in the 80s. I got sucked into this world of drugs because I was looking for a way of escape. But if I had known anything about the word, Jesus is our way of escape, but I was never taught that. Now, you know, if you'd have asked me, you know, is Jesus the son of God? I knew enough. I'd seen the painting of the last supper on my great grandmother's kitchen wall. I would have said, oh, sure. You know, but I didn't, I, I, it wasn't a faith confession. It was, I saw a a painting and my great great grandmother told me. So um, I think that we're seeing a lot of that in today's youth where they don't know the real Jesus. They've heard of Jesus you know, maybe they know somebody who knows Jesus, uh, but they've never met Jesus. And because I didn't meet Jesus, I, I met the enemy for real. Oh my goodness. Okay. So what do you mean you met the enemy for real? So was this during your yeah. teen years or was this a little bit after? This was sometime after, and I don't even believe I've shared this in my film. As I was telling you, I've got a film called Vindicated that precedes the book and you can watch it at jenniferleclair.org slash vindicated film. Um, but I remember I was just sort of lost. I was in my early twenties and my best friend from college moved away and I was just kind of friendless, depressed. And he said, you know, you should make friends with my sister. My sister's awesome. You'll love my sister. She's just like me. I said, okay, well, I didn't know, but his sister was a cocaine addict. So I got wrapped up in doing cocaine. And one night I was there and this is just, I still remember this and Somebody knocked on the door of the house. This lady, my friend, was with her boyfriend. Somebody knocks on the door. Long story short, these two men, my friend's boyfriend and this other guy, were pointing guns at each other's heads. And I'm sitting two feet away, like frozen, saying, um, uh, uh, like, I couldn't run out. I didn't know what, to, I don't know if I was about to die. The guy left. The whole incident's over. But my friend's boyfriend takes so much cocaine that he begins to literally manifest as Satan. Like he was saying, I am Satan and you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to do the other. And he was, I don't believe he was actually Satan, but I believe he was manifest. I didn't know it then, but he was manifesting demons and these demons were talking to me. So, I mean, I met the devil and it freaked me out. He overdosed that same night, almost died. And at that point, I actually moved away from those friends, I didn't, you know, just out of my natural life preservation, I I didn't connect with those friends anymore. But um, I mean, I saw some really bad stuff uh, when I was younger. That, you know, you touched on something that's really important 
and I'm really sorry that happened to you, but you said mm -hmm. that he overdosed that night, but when he was high on drugs, the devil spoke through him. So could you touch a little bit on drugs and how that possibly can usher in demonic spirits? Because I don't think a lot of people know that. Yeah, well, you know, pharmakia is the Greek word uh, that we would use for drugs. And drugs, any kind of drug, is a gateway to the demonic. What happens is our guard comes down, the enemy takes advantage, we are agreeing with darkness, we are walking in rebellion. And, you know, like I said, I was smoking weed from about 15 years old. You know, I would go out and do LSD and get lost in parks and come home and have dinner. And my parents didn't even know I was high. I, we, we were doing ecstasy. My my best friend when I was a teenager started having epileptic seizures because of the ecstasy. So we were going into farmlands and, and picking mushrooms to boil them and create shrooms. And all of these things open you up to, to demons. So um, this man he began to manifest. He said he was Satan and he was, they actually had a picture of Jesus on their wall. They were Catholic and he was pointing at Jesus. And he was actually telling me, you need to bow to Jesus. You need to do this. But it was like a, it was a, it was a false manifestation. I, to this day, I, I don't have full revelation on what that was because this person manifesting through my friend's boyfriend who said they were Satan were trying to tell me I needed to live for the Lord. It was the strangest thing. And then he passed out, was rushed to the hospital, almost died. But drugs are, are a, a big game. Of course, that's not the only thing. Many Christians think they're immune from demons because they've never done drugs or don't do drugs. But there's a whole lot of things that open you up to demons. I think we all know that. Okay, so now you just open another can of worms. What do you mean? Because now <laughs> a lot of Christians are thinking, okay, I didn't do drugs, but now what could open me up to demons? Yeah, well, you know, there's a works of the flesh in Galatians 5. You know, there's rebellion, there's, there's drunkenness, lasciviousness, all these things. And if we sin in the flesh long enough, anger, a big one, uh, even um, uh, self-pity, there are certain doorways uh, to the demonic. A lot of it is what we do in our flesh for which we do not repent. It's practicing a sin over and over and over into the point that you're not, you're justifying it. You're not repenting of it. It opens up the door. I believe firmly that some of the music, some of the TV broadcasts, some of the movies that Christians watch, we have no business watching them. Now, I'm not trying to be legalistic, but what I am trying to be is holy. And some of these things, we're watching perversion, we're watching violence, we're watching uh, profanity. And if we don't think that's affecting our souls or opening us up to enemy attack, perhaps not demonization, but enemy attack, I mean, you can't sit there and watch show, certain shows where they're fornicating, they're having affairs, and, and, and think that the enemy is not going to use that seed that you allowed him to plant in your soul to tempt you into similar acts. It's, it's going to happen sooner or later. The enemy will strike at an opportune time. That's deep. So let's continue on to the night where your friend's boyfriend almost died of, a, in, of an overdose. Yeah. And so after that, where was your mindset? I mean, you saw someone demonically possessed. Did you think, okay, I need to get out of this lifestyle or did you continue down that path? Um, I thought I need to get out of this house. That's for sure. Um, I didn't know that he was demonized. I didn't know what was going on. I was scared. Um, but I, I continued going down that path until I moved out of that region. And even after I moved out of that region, moved into a whole new region, I would still send them money to send me drugs in the mail because I was addicted to it and I couldn't get it down here. So I was still, until the one day they sent me, um, powder that was not, it wasn't drugs. It wasn't cocaine. It was it was fake. It was powder and it burned my nose. And I realized they ripped me off, but it was the best thing that could ever happen because I couldn't find it anywhere. So I just stopped, I just stopped doing it. Um, but no, I, I, I just was, um, you know, traumatized, I guess I was miserable. I grew up in a very tense environment, a lot of emotional abuse. You know, I broke my leg twice when I was a kid. So I probably had demons of trauma because of that. I was in a body cast, had to learn how to walk all over again. Um, and I think that when we're children, we have no way to protect ourselves, to process our emotions. And if we don't have parents who are Christians, 
they don't know better. They're trying to do their best. You know, we, we cannot blame our parents for the problems we have when we age or when we grow up. But, you know, I didn't have any guardrails. And on top of this, I had a big call of God on my life. So I believe the enemy, he doesn't know everything, but I believe the enemy sees markers of God's calling on our life. And because I had this huge call, I mean, obviously we're in over a hundred nations right now with our prayer hubs, awakening prayer hubs. We're in Israel, we're in Tajikistan, we're all over the Middle East, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Europe, all over the place. You know, the enemy didn't know I was going to do all that, but he knew I was going to do something. And he tried to shut me down from since I was a, a young child and then tried to kill me with the drugs and then tried to put me in prison and steal my destiny. But God, amen. Genesis 50, amen. 20, he takes what the enemy meant for harm and he turns it for good. What got you off of drugs? So I know you said that they sent you a bad batch of, I guess, cocaine and you just stopped. I mean, did you stop drugs altogether or did you just stop that cocaine? I just, I just stopped that. I think I've smoked weed since I was 15 years old and I didn't stop except for when I was pregnant. I didn't stop uh, until after I got saved. Um, so, I mean, I, that was a long time. So, but it was in my household, you know, my parents were smoking it. So therefore it was easy to obtain. Um, I probably never would have started if my parents hadn't been uh, doing that. So, you know, that's, that's uh, an unfortunate, but again, we have to take responsibility for, for our decisions and for the choices we make in life. And so we can, we have to avoid that victim mentality because that will completely derail your life. So thank God that, uh, you know, he, he delivered me from so much. Now, I'm glad you mentioned that about your parents and about parents in general, because like you said, when you become older, you can't really blame your parents anymore. You have to take responsibility. So I do like that because I know a lot of people are holding on to animosity and resentment towards their parents because, you know, they should have done this. They should have done that. But like you said, a lot of the times parents do the best that they know how, you know, to do. So it's mm -hmm. good that you mentioned that. So, okay. So you mentioned your family, you know, your husband. So how did you meet your husband? Because that is what basically got you into the predicament you got in with jail. So what <laughs> happened? How did you meet him and all of that? Well, I left home when I was 18 years old and went out on my own. I didn't want to live with my parents anymore. They moved away to Dallas. I didn't want to leave Florida. So I went out on my own. And after about a year, I was starving to death. I couldn't feed myself, couldn't support myself. I was, you know, 19 years old at that time. And my grandma, who lived a few hours away, said, you know, honey, you're going to come live with me. So I did. And I started to go to college there uh, while I lived with my grandparents. And I was so introverted. It's really, I technically still call myself an introvert, but people don't know it because I'm you know, preaching and teaching and laughing and joking. But I like to be very quiet. And I figured if I joined the school paper, I could make friends, low key you know, be kind of like, so I joined the school paper and I found out there because I hated writing. So I don't know why I joined the paper, hated it, hated it, hated it. Um, but I joined the paper and I found that I was really good at writing. And a young man was there and he was uh, a photographer. And so we would be sent out on assignment together and I would write the story and he would take the photos. So we'd spend a lot of time together. We had a group of friends. And so I met him, I met him in college and he was the kindest, sweetest guy he had been a missionary um, of a different religion, which I did not understand, but he had been a missionary and he was one that would never let anybody talk bad about anybody else behind their back. He was kind, he was giving, he was honest. And so that was very attractive to me. I thought, well, this is a good guy. He was good looking. Um, he, he was godly, or at least that's what I thought. And um, so we met in college and um, man, it just kind of spirals down from there. All right, Jennifer, what do you mean it spiraled down from there? Because like you said, he seemed like the perfect guy. Now, this is, I'm going to ask you a question that a lot of people mm, may be thinking about, or they fall into these traps. Now, you said you thought he was a great guy, perfect guy. You know, how can people know whether a relationship they're getting into is a genuine relationship? meaning if this person is who they say they are? That's a great question. And I'll preface it by saying when I met him, he was who he said he was, but he connected with some people who kind of turned his heart. But first of all, if you're a Christian, 
the Lord will show you who you're to be with. But maybe, you know, maybe you made a mistake and married the wrong guy like I did. That happens. So then what happens is we start to lack confidence and we get a get a little gun shy. We have trust issues and all these different things. But God is able to lead us. You know, Scripture says that the Holy Spirit within us bears witness with us that we're children of God. So if the Holy Spirit can bear witness in our spirit that we're saved, he can bear witness to the one we're supposed to marry. But I would look for signs because here's here's what I've learned. Uh, people, man or woman, they are on their best behavior while they're in the dating process. I mean, they have manners. They clean up after themselves. They, you know, they're generous. They pray. Uh, they do all the things that they look perfect. So here's my best advice that I give young people in my church. Until you've gone through a major trial with someone or seen someone go through a major trial, you don't really know them. And so I've seen young people uh, get married. I, one young girl that uh, I'm close to, she's been married twice now because she she just married the wrong one the first time, never saw him go through a trial, then jumped into another relationship and never saw him go through a trial, made the same mistake. But you know what? God redeems things. And God, no matter how many mistakes people have made, you know, don't beat yourself up. There's no condemnation in Christ. Just go a little, go a little slower. I don't think a lot of people have heard that. So you watch them go through trial. That makes a lot of sense. And then you see how they handle things. Um, and now you yep. know what you're getting. Um, that's really good. Yep. Okay. So you end up marrying him. And tell us about that. Well, we lived together for a number of years. I wasn't saved. He was excommunicated from his religion because they considered that sin. Um, what I didn't know. Religion? He was a Mormon. Okay. So- so I was living with my grandparents and he was dating me and my grandparents were telling me, honey, this is not a, a Jesus follower. This is not Christianity. But because I didn't know the difference, I wasn't saved. I didn't know Jesus. So he was, he was acting like what people told me Jesus was like. So, eh, you know, my, I just figured my grandparents, they, what do they know? And they, they would sit there and debate with him in a very kind way about what he believed. And I'm watching and my grand and it was all very kind and pleasant, but I I didn't understand what was going on. I had no spiritual grid. So when they his parents found out he was dating me, they kicked him out. My grandparents let him move in to their home. This is how kind they were. And they just figured, well, if she loves him, we're not going to talk her out of it. So he can stay in the house. So he lived there. So we lived all together. And then eventually we got our own apartment. And um, uh, we didn't get married till we came down to South Florida. We were actually up in um, uh, the uh, central Florida area when, as the story goes, and this is all in very much detail in the, in the film and in the book, um, he came home one day and he was very angry. And I don't know why. Um, he had never presented with anger before. He was always very kind. There was never really any ups and downs. He was kind of always the same. So when he came home really upset, I was like, you know, what's up? What's the matter with you? Now, I was in a deep depression. Uh, I, I can't remember why, but I'd laid in bed for about a year and watching the O.J. Simpson trials. That's how long ago it was. This is how long ago it was. And I was just laying there. I was very depressed. And I was operating his business, but I pretty much didn't do anything. And he came home. He was just angry. And I said, what's the matter? And he snapped back at me. And I said, what are you talking to me? Like, what? I'm like shocked. Before I knew it, he's throwing bowls and dishes and I'm ducking. And he, he, the one of the bowls hits the wall and I run through the, the door and ran in the room and locked the door. And I was scared to death because, I mean, I have never, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what he was going to do. Wow. OK, so how how long were you together that he became violent? We were together in total for 10 years, but this was on probably the. Let's see, 99. This was probably like eight years in, seven years in. And I just, seven years, he was steady. He was, oh my goodness. but what I didn't know was he was, he was bipolar and that was when it began to manifest. So sometimes those mental health issues, they don't manifest until we get in our, you know, in our mid to late twenties. And so he was starting to manifest um, with with this bipolar and it was it was his emotions were starting to swing and I had seen the depression side but I hadn't seen the angry side so I knew that he would go into depressions 
But that didn't really, I mean, I hated it for him, but it didn't really bother me. It scared me. But the anger was, so he had swung the other way and he was being violent. And I just, it really, really, really shocked me and scared me. Wow. Okay. So I want you to touch on bipolar really quickly, because you said something interesting that even more people don't even know that it kind of comes to a head or begin to develop even more so as you get older. Um, so bipolar and any mental illness, you know, disorder, can a person be delivered from that? I absolutely think it was demon. So his dad was bipolar. His sister, who I was very close friends with, she actually got put in a mental institution for some time because she had the same thing. And so it, they would say it was generational, like, you know, it's the family line, medically speaking, it but it was it was a curse because I believe when they when they adopted this false religion, I believe many demons came in uh, with it because his father had no history of bipolar in his you know when he was in his twenties or thirties. It wasn't until later when they adopted this religion, and I believe this religion is actually demonic. And I could get into that, but I'm not an expert on it. But certainly, you know, the man who founded it, Joseph Smith, claims that he had met an angel named Moroni who gave him instructions to write down the Book of Mormon on these plates in gold. And it's just, it's it's not real. It's one of those things where Paul says, you know, they're puffed up in the imagination of their mind. It was a demonic encounter this guy had. I'm not saying he wasn't sincere. I, I don't know, but it, it, it's, it's a false religion. It's a false Jesus. And um, so when you embrace a lie like that, uh, you definitely open yourself up for all kind of demons. So he was demonized, but it just didn't manifest. And, you know, it manifested as depression, but it, it didn't manifest as anger until later. You know, Jennifer, it's interesting that you mentioned how it didn't start until they joined Mormonism, because before then they didn't have that in their family line. But once the father joined, then the family members begin to have bipolar disorder. Mm hmm. Wow. Yeah, be because the the generational because of a generational curse. So, mm -hmm. you know, the generational curse travels down down the bloodline and you know, unfortunately, I don't believe that particular faith has any grid for that. Uh but I remember Kenneth Hagen telling a story, Kenneth Kenneth E Hagen, the late Kenneth E Hagen from the Word of Faith movement, he went out to the the temple in Utah. And he brought his family with him. I don't know. He's walking the grounds, just checking it out. Not because he wanted to go there, but because he wanted to see what was going on. And he couldn't find his son. He goes looking for his son and he finds his son behind a tree convulsing. So Kenneth Hagen, this is in one of his books, Kenneth Hagen goes over and begins to cast devils out of his son that had entered into him just from being on the campus. Imagine embracing the religion, reading the Book of Mormon. And I'll just say this. One of the things the Mormons tell you to try to get you to embrace their religion is to say, read the whole Book of Mormon and ask the Lord if this is really him and he'll confirm it to you. So, but how many of you know, it's a demon that's confirming it. So he gave me a Book of Mormon and I started to read it, but quite frankly, I found it to be very racist. It had, you know, certain, you know, what we'd call African-Americans, but obviously they were, they were like the bad guys and then the white guys were the good guys. And I'm like, this is racist. I'm not reading this. And so I put it down, but thank God, um, because uh, if I'd have read to the end, I might have, you know, gone down that same way. When you speak, I don't think you realize it. You go into deep rabbit trails, really deep. And you say yeah. things that, <laughs> that people want more of, because you said something <laughs> that was, this was a nugget, how you said that when they say read the book of Mormon all the way through and ask Holy spirit to confirm it. And you said that is actually a demon that confirms it to you. And you're right because the book of Mormon, it teaches, I think it teaches that blacks are of Lucifer, right? I guess they're Lucifer's children or something, so, something like something yeah. like that. It's, yeah. it's like they're um, lesser than yeah. subservient. So it, it's, it's, it's completely racist. Yeah. And, and as a matter of fact, the Mormon church today is still trying to overcome that racist uh, con uh, uh, connotation. They've actually tried to promote some African-Americans to places of prominence, but come on, man, really? I, no, if you're African American or black, that's not really a religion you want to join. Um, uh -uh. Now. <laughs> All right. So now 
on Mormonism. So, but Mormons say that they're Christian. And like you said, a lot of them are, they appear to be genuine. They believe that they are Mm -hmm. genuine about it. They say they're Christian, but what would you say to a Mormon who may be watching right now, who may be thinking, you know, I'm thinking maybe this isn't the right path. What would you say to them right now? Mormonism there are Mormons that I believe are wonderful, beautiful people. I'm not against the people and I believe they're very sincerely seeking God. So I'm not a Mormon hater. Um, They're very passionate about what they believe, but Mormonism is a works based religion. And scripture says that we are saved uh, by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. You know, there's a, a joke and it says that the, if you if you're living in a housing community or an apartment complex, man, you want a Mormon as a neighbor. And the reason why is because they will mow your grass. They will pick up your kids from school. They will go to the grocery store for you and run errands. Why? Because because they, they truly believe, Jennifer, that if if they work and work and work, they can be their own God yeah. and they will have their own universe. That's the deception. And so but there's not much place for women. And African Americans aren't, 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 you know, I mean, that right there should tell you that's not Jesus, because Jesus said there's there, there's neither male nor, nor female nor Greek nor Jew, right? We, we're all one. We're all the same, one blood. We all came from Adam and Eve. So, and the Mormonism, it's their their book is another testament of Jesus Christ. They say that Jesus came to North America and hung out here, you know, at some point. It's like okay, all right. So Jennifer, all right. So now. You're married to him and you have a child. What happens because he eventually abandons you and your child? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, we moved down here, down south to Miami from Central Florida. And he was a photographer and had a lot of business. And when the NBA went on strike in 1997, or 1998, um, the NBA one on strike was a big deal. So a lot of his business was tied up in, you know, sports photography. So he had no work. I mean, he literally had no work, but I was working for a Fortune 500 company. I was a journalist. I was actually a project manager and editor. And I was making back then, you know, in the late nineties, $3,000 a week, which was a ton of money back then. It's a lot of money now. Um, so somewhere along the line, he became the primary caregiver for my daughter because I had to work. I mean, you know, we, you know, what are we, what are you gonna do? So that bruised his ego and he went into another one of those spins and, um, got depressed and, uh, you know, he disappeared and wouldn't know where he was. And, and, you know, he started carrying a gun, which he got wrapped up with some bad people, I think in a vulnerable moment because he was, like I said, he was, he was, he was, he was drinking like crazy. He never drank. He, you know, had gone down to to Cuba and apparently was smuggling, helping to smuggle Cuban baseball players into the country. Um, they would call our house and talk in Spanish and I didn't know what was going on. And finally, finally, somebody told me, oh, he was getting paid to help smuggle Cuban baseball players into America. So these are things I've never said publicly, but But it's true. So he got wrapped up with this crowd and became like a different person because he was kind. He was sweet. And he did have that one incident um, where he came home and threw all the stuff. That's what was the initial arrest uh, because I called the police. But that was a, a flash in the pan. He never acted like that again. But he got around these bad people. You know, scripture says bad company corrupts good morals. And he literally just became a different person. So he said, you know, I just need to find my way. I've got no work. I need to build my portfolio. And he goes, I want to go down to Latin America because I, there's nothing around here to take pictures of. And, and, and so I'm like fully supportive. I'm, I can see that you're passionate about your craft. I'm in my career doing my thing. And I you know, said, go do it. So he went, he'd come back and he went and he'd come back and he'd go and he'd come back a few times and he'd show the pictures and it seemed to put new life into him. And I thought, well, this is good for him. We can afford it. It doesn't cost that much to be down there. And one time he left, it was the 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 day after Halloween. I remember we took our daughter trick-or-treating 
And the next morning, he walked me down to the pier, and there's the water. And he says, you know, when I get back this time, I want us to renew our wedding vows because I feel like we just had a rough time. And I want us like, wow, okay, gave me diamond earrings, whole thing. It was really wild. And, you know, told him goodbye. And then he disappears, completely disappears. And I thought for about the first week, I didn't hear from him. So I thought, well, he's up in the mountains. You know, there's no signal. And finally, one of my best friends said, it's been like 10 days now. You probably need to find out if he's okay, contact the embassy or do something because he could literally be in a prison down there waiting for you to find him. So I was like, okay, um, uh, I will. And I did. And I found, bottom line is, I found that he had connected with a, a woman down there and that he her, her, he had told his everybody that, you know, he wasn't coming back. So that was it. And, you know, I told like probably more of the story in the movie. So I want everybody to go to jenniferleclair.org slash vindicated film. Um, but it was uh, it was a, the shock of my life. I think I think I think I don't think I've ever been more shocked about anything in my life to this day because he was so close to his daughter. I mean, they, she just they just oh my lord she loved him and he loved her and when she, when he left she was devastated and she'd stand outside the door you know banging on the door thinking her dad was outside and that was the hardest part of it but um i attribute that to his manic depression the demons um and this crowd he got connected with that just seemed to turn his heart the wrong way but um uh, it worked out for my better though jennifer because you know, God does say in Romans eight twenty eight that, you know, he'll work all things together for our good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Probably I would have ended up to be a Mormon at some point. Probably he would have gone back to his faith and convinced me to do so. And I'd probably be on my way to hell right now. So, you know, you can marry the wrong person and God can still redeem it all. He can work it for good. And I'm I'm actually grateful. And I'll just say this for all of you out there who, you know, you feel feel bitter towards your past. I can literally honestly say I am glad I am, I'm a better person for having been married to him. What he did was wrong, but he had a lot of wrong things happen to him. And although I can't justify what he did, particularly to his daughter, I am grateful because I learned so much. There were a lot of good times and I have a beautiful daughter and I gained a lot from it and I'll never be the same. And, you know, we need to begin to look at our past through the, the lens of redemption rather than through the lens of bitterness. And we're going to jump really quickly and come right back. Did he ever come back? No, I never saw him again. To this day, I have never laid eyes on him again. He has no relationship with his daughter at all. It's as if he died. It's really as if he died. Um, essentially, it was like he died. Um, and I grieved like he died because I knew that I was never going to see him again. I just knew instinctively, and I was mad at God. I mean, I literally shook my fist at God. However, I will say this, I was ready to get divorced because the, the marriage was on the rocks since my daughter had been born, things just, and then he lost his income. It just, he just, you know, was carrying guns, drinking. I was ready to get out of the marriage, but I wouldn't have done it like that. I would have gotten marriage counseling. I would have, tried to separate in an amicable way and, you know, do all the things right. So I was ready to, to leave the marriage. So that's why when he left, I was mad, but I wasn't as hurt. I was hurt, but I wasn't as hurt as some people would be. I was more hurt because my daughter was hurting. I was more angry because of what she was suffering than I was for myself because I was ready to walk away. I just wanted to be friends, but he just sort of, he blew that up. You know, <laughs> he just cold, totally blew that up. Wow. So did you even hear from him? Like a phone call, a letter, anything? Um, I tracked him down. I called him. I spoke to him one time. After I got saved, I tracked him down again and I called him and I told him, you know, I went to jail. They wanted to put me in prison for 10 years. And um, I just want you to know that I found Jesus and I want to, you know, I, I tried to, I, I preached the gospel to him. I tried to get him saved and he said, well, I'm glad for you and I wish you well. And he goes, I've come to, to learn that, you know, God is just in our mind and it's whatever we make it. So I guess he, I don't know what he went into. He didn't go back to Mormonism, but he was, he was lost. And I am not pleased about that. I would love nothing more than to see him 
come to the Lord because I, you know, I believe the real him is a good guy and anybody can lose their way. You know, apart from Christ, we're all just, you know, a, the heart is deceitful above all things who can know it. So how old was your daughter when he left? Two. But does she remember him now because she was so young or not really? Nope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now she's got photos of him that, that, you know, I had an album and I said, if you wanted these photos and she took some, but um, nope, she's never spoken to him. She doesn't want to, because I told her, if you want to talk to him, I can track him down. She said, no, I, I don't. Um, maybe she will one day, but she doesn't want to. And I, I don't blame her. He wasn't part of her life. So uh, I know some kids do get curious who were adopted or who didn't know their dad or their mom and go seek them out. Um, but no, she's, she seems perfectly fine. She had a good life. She grew up in the church and we you know, she never wanted for anything except a father, you know, and that's a big thing to want for, but, um, we were well taken care of by the Lord. So how did you find that closure? I mean, for someone you loved, you know, even though you were going through a rocky relationship in your marriage for mm -hmm. some time, how did you deal with that closure? Or did you find, <sighs> of course you did find closure, but I mean, that's a lot, yeah. you know, you know, things happened. So much was going on at the same time. I just, I, I think I remember when I got saved in the jail, the first thing that I did was deeply forgive my ex-husband. Um, that was the first thing I did. That was the first thing that came to my heart because I knew that I had ought against him. I was mad at him. And that was the first thing I did. And I think when I forgave, that was when the real healing began because it is hurtful. It, you know, even though I was ready for the marriage to be over, it doesn't mean that it wasn't hurtful for him just to get up and leave. It was hurtful. And I, but see, here's the thing. We cannot begin to heal until we forgive. And really God fast tracked my healing. He delivered me. He healed me. It probably took about a year or so after I got saved, maybe two years for me to get completely free from demons that I had um, from wrong thought patterns that were keeping me in a victim mentality. That was a big one. I had a massive victim mentality. Um, but God really fast tracked my growth and I'm grateful for that. But I think that was partly because when I got saved, I got radically saved. I didn't just get some jailhouse religion. I literally went all in for Jesus. I was reading the Bible day and night, praying day and night. I was at the church every time the doors were open. And that makes a difference. You know, when you sow to the spirit, you reap from the spirit. That's good. Okay. So when you were with him, because I want to go back to what you just said in a minute, but when you were with him, he was Mormon. Where was your faith? Were you agnostic? Were you Catholic? Were you just, what was your faith? Because I know you said you were angry with God for a little bit. So you knew there was a God. I, yeah, I knew there was a God. Um, I decided when I was about 18 years old, 19 years old, I decided that when I was 40, I'd get saved. And that's, I know that's ridiculous, but that I, I believed there was a God. I mean, if you'd have asked me if Jesus, you know, do you believe in Jesus? I would have said, yeah, he's the son of God. But I never heard the gospel. I never opened the Bible. I didn't have any paradigm for what Christianity was. But because, you you know, especially, you know, that was a long time ago, America was really more of a Christian nation then. And so, you know, there was Christian values. and But I, I didn't have any faith. I just figured I wanted to live my life. I saw Christianity as a future necessity that, but very restrictive. And I didn't want to be tied down to all these rules and regulations. And I didn't understand that whatever Christianity I had seen modeled, which was the Catholic church and then the Presbyterian church. And I'm not putting down the Presbyterian church, but what I experienced those two times that I actually went somewhere, it was very religious. It was very don't, 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 don't where, you know, for Christ's sake, Jesus said, us, God set us free. So we're free. And the Jesus that I know wasn't the Jesus that I saw in other people when I was growing up, they'd say they're Christian, but they're mean like snakes, you know? So I had no faith. Yeah. Okay. So when you said that uh, you had demons, what do you mean you had demons? Oh, I needed, I needed deliverance. I had a spirit of fear. I had a legion of fear demons. It was maybe two years after I got 
saved. I was in a particular church and the deliverance minister in the church said, you need to come in for a session. You're riddled with fear. So I went in for a session and I was scared to death because I'd seen deliverance in the church and I'd seen people, you know, flailing around and all that. I'm like, I don't want to do that. That's embarrassing. I don't want to do that. And then they said, you're going to have the deliverance upstairs. And upstairs in the church, there was these concrete floors. And I mean, I had visions of myself, my head cracking my skull open, flailing around. I was so scared. I didn't want to go. But I went and I literally still, two years after I got saved, thought that every time that I made a mistake or committed a sin, wrong thought, wrong deed, whatever, losing my temper, that I had to get born again, again. Mm. And even though I was in a you know charismatic apostolic church, nobody, I still didn't have an understanding of the, the, the depths of what Jesus did for me. And I think that's true even for a lot of Christians today. But I had a legion, which means I had thousands of fear demons. I had rejection. And those were the two major strongholds. I also had, um, when I first got saved, I was taking antidepressants. And I was taking anti-anxiety medicine when I first got saved. And after I got saved, I said, I, I don't need these anymore. Like I literally felt, I didn't know anything about deliverance or demons, but I just knew that I didn't need this medicine anymore. But there was a doctor there in the jail that forced me to take the medication. And I said, I don't need it. And they said, you're going to take it. We're going to throw you in the isolation. I said, well, I guess I'll take it, you know? So I took it. And I immediately, not on purpose, but immediately, as soon as I swallowed it, I vomited it back up right in front of the operation, the, the, the police officer. And they said, okay, you don't have to take that, you don't have to take that anymore. <laughs> but because when I got saved, God, this is really, people need to know this. When I got saved, when you get saved, God may deliver you from some things immediately, mm. but there may be other things that you're not ready to walk it out. You know, you're not ready to, to, to hold and maintain that deliverance. So God's not going to deliver you something that you can't keep free from, get stay free from because seven other demons scripture says will come back and fill that space. So, you know, I don't believe we get completely free from everything in the moment we get saved. And at the least we have to renew our minds. Yeah. Well, you know what? That begs the question. So the medication that you were on, was that a medication that you would have to wean off of? Or was that a medication where you just stop taking? Because I know there's some antidepressants yeah. where you have to wean off of. Yeah, no, they, I had, I was on that stuff for years. I was on, um, and that was because of my upbringing, right? I, I had demons of fear and demons of anxiety and demons of depression because of, because of the, what I experienced is, is to my household, the fear that the, 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 the rage, the episodes, uh, the violence. Um, but yeah, no, I had been taking that since I was 19. At the time, I was 29 years old. So I've been taking that for 10 years. So yeah, you don't just stop taking everything. And that's why they were trying to make me take it. And I, But no, and I never have never, never taken any, any of that ever again. I've never um, gone into a depression. Um, you know, every I do have anxious thoughts sometimes. We all do. You have to cast those down. But I've never, I've never needed anything like that. Jesus really just set me free. Wow. And so you didn't have any withdrawal after or anything? No, nope, nothing. What did you mean when you said you had a victim mentality? Because I think this is what holds a lot of people back. They blame other people for where they are or where they are not. So how did you have a victim mentality and who was it toward? Yeah, so... The victim mentality is the, the mentality that look what they did to me. It's not fair. It's not right. Somebody should pay, you know, the man at the, with the, with the, the, who was laying by the pool for 38 years and he couldn't get in the water before somebody else, the angel trouble the water. He was like, I can't get in the water. It, it's, 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 it's a, I deserve better. I had a victim mentality. I don't know when it started, but after that police officer beat me bloody, uh, or I should say beat me, I had bruises. Uh, I think that was really the factor that left me with a victim mentality. And the problem is, and I talk about this in the book, Vindicated, the problem is you cannot hold on to a victim mentality and gain vindication. You, you have to get let go of the victim mentality if you want vindication. They don't mix. So I couldn't even see... Um, until I forgave that police officer, 
I think I would have probably gone to prison for 10 years if I hadn't got saved in that jail and had not forgiven that police officer. I believe that I would have just, I, I, I think I would have gone down. And my daughter would have been without a mother. She'd have been 13 years old. By the time I got out, it would have ruined her life and mine. But God is gracious. Yes, he's he faithful. Is. Amen. Amen. So let's go down that path. How <laughs> did you, Jennifer LeClaire, get arrested, thrown into jail and face 10 years? What happened? Yeah. So when he came home, was throwing the dishes and the bowls, I ran into the other room and slammed the door. And I said, if you don't stop, I'm going to call the police. Long story short, he didn't stop. I called the police. They came. Now, this was during the O.J. Simpson trial. And the law or the protocol was anybody that calls for a domestic violence incident, everybody's going to jail. And we're going to sort it out later. Yeah. I, now, if I had known that, I would never have called the police. But I thought they had to, I mean, he was literally in a rage. Like, I did not know if he was going to cause me bodily harm. I, I was really that scared. And I probably already had a spirit of fear. That didn't help. But, you know, at the time, I had tattoos. I had an eyebrow ring. I had, you know, just hair that just came down like this. The rest of it was bald. So I probably looked like a, 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 a rabble rouser. Um but this cop, she was a, a female, but she was kind of burly, like a man. And she just had it in for me. And she told me, go sit down over there. I went and sat down over there, but there were some ants biting my ankles. This is really a simple story. And the ants were crawling over my feet. So I scooted over, you know, maybe a foot to get out of the ant pile. And when I did, she, you know, marched over to me picked me up and said, you're, you're going in. And I said, why I didn't do anything. She goes, you're, 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 you're going in. I'm taking you in. And I'm like, but I didn't do anything. And she's like, you better shut up or I'm going to say that you hit me. And I said, I, 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 you know, I didn't, I haven't, I just, I just, you know, I'm like freaking out. She takes me, she slams me on the police car and she takes her club and just starts beating me. And, and I mean, I have pictures. I was bruised. She didn't hit my face, but she, she, she uh, bruised all over my body and I was like crying out, please stop, stop, stop. What did I do? And she charged me with resisting arrest with violence and battery on a law enforcement officer. So the sentence for that was 10 years. Now I was already in this funk. I was already in this depression. So when I, you know, went before the judge, I didn't even, I didn't get an attorney you know, I got an attorney, but I wasn't calling calling him back. I wasn't cooperating. So I ended up, I think, pushing me to a, 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 a public defender. And long story short, I didn't even fight the charges. I, I mean, it was my word against hers. The other officer wouldn't testify. But I looked, you know, I had the hair and I had the piercings and I didn't. And bottom line is I pled no contest and they let me go on a uh, probation issue or they had, I had to do a probation or something. And that was the end of that for about seven years. Nothing happened. It was, it was dormant because I did what I was supposed to do. I filled out all my paperwork. And unfortunately there was a misplaced piece of paper in the system somewhere. And because of that misplaced piece of paper, when I went to get divorced, I found out there was a, uh, uh, a warrant for my arrest. And that was where just everything kind of blew up. Imagine, you know, your husband leaves and literally 30 days later, you find out that the police can come pick you up, put you in prison for 10 years for a violation any minute. So I was absolutely freaking out, did not know what to do. And um, just that's when things just completely spiraled out of control. It, it, I don't tell all this in the book, but I do tell keys to how I got where I am today and how I got vindicated. But these are stories you guys that are watching this. You're, you're getting an exclusive here because I've never given this interview before. So you guys should be following Jennifer because she does great interviews. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Again, like I said, I love your name. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Now, this is deep because, I mean, one, I couldn't picture you with, you know, hair the way you described bald head um piercings and tattoos eyebrow ring and the fact that so basically the judge saw you based on how you appeared right so 
he or she judged you based off of almost based off of that and based off of what the police officer said like you didn't look like a you know a clean young lady like they would you know like say okay maybe she didn't but you looked the part and you were now having a warrant for your arrest so you didn't get arrested or you did get arrested but you didn't get put into prison right away right or were you you know did the warrant come to fruition and they come and get you how did that look yeah so i spent like 24 hours in jail during that first arrest and had to get out on bail and seven years later six years later that's when there had been a warrant for my arrest but what's miraculous about this is really think about it this is where where the hand of god it shows you the preserving hand of god in my life because i was driving a car i was um you know i had a driver's license it wasn't a secret where i was everybody had my address you know i had a paycheck right i was paying social security um i started a business um i was not in hiding so i had filled out all my papers and so i wasn't cons- concerned about being arrested um so this was quite a shock i i could have i listen i i sped when i drove <laughs> you know i mean i could have gotten pulled over any time for speeding and that that warrant would have shown up right because that warrant was out there for six years i had a baby you know we didn't have insurance so i was on medicaid when they put all that in medicaid that should have flagged that i had a warrant all of these things i mean i was told this so all those years god preserved me but this is what i believe i believe the reason why all that i mean god just kept covering me is because he knew that i had to hit rock bottom in the world's terms before i could get saved so you know long story short i don't want to give away the whole movie but go watch that at vindicate at jennifer leclair.org slash vindicated film long story short i got put in jail i got arrested and <laughs> i could tell you all kind of things that you got you really got to go watch the movie but when i was in the jail i'll tell you this is not in the movie i was such a schemer at the time that I, I I mean, I wanted to get out of jail. So I was talking on the phone to my mother and I, it crossed my mind, man, if I like had a heart attack or something, they'd have to let me go home because they wouldn't let me go home. I, I mean, they had really no evidence against me. This thing's old. So it's their fault. So my attorneys tell me it's a paperwork issue. No, no problem. <laughs> so I just collapsed on the ground and pretended that I passed out. And I mean, people came running. I did. I was a schemer. No one's, no one's ever told me. No, you, you, you've got the scoop here. Oh, I feel special. I, I laid there. <laughs> yeah, you are special. I laid there. And and I mean, they all the inmates start, hey, hey, CO, CO. And they took me to the hospital. And I thought for sure, they're going to have to let me go home. Well, they did not let me go home. They handcuffed me, feet and hands to the bed. But, you know. They did every test known to mankind and they said, oh, you have, you, you have nothing, there's nothing wrong with you. And they sent me back. So they sent me back. I had to go through the strip search all over. They, they spray all this nasty soap on you and spray it off. And, you know, it's just a really bad situation. Hmm. I wouldn't want any, anybody to go there. But when I came back in, I had to go back to the, generation, the, gener- the general population. That's when uh, the Bill Glass Circus Ministry came in and they were giving testimonies. And long story short, I heard this testimony and a friend of mine, oh, I, I met this friend in prison, in jail, and she was a Christian. Now, I don't, how do Christians end up in jail other than for preaching the gospel? And I don't know, but she was a Christian. She loved the Lord. She knew the word. And she's like, come listen to these people talk. And I did. And then and she's they're They're making the call for salvation. And she's poking me, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand, say yes. And I'm like, look at her like, She's like, oh, no, this is what you need. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit convicted me, and I, I got saved. And they gave me, I started over there, they gave me this, this little Bible with very fine print, paperback Bible. And I mean, I really got saved. 
I mean to tell you, I read that Bible day and night. I went over in the Christian ward of the jail and I, we had Bible study three times a day with the prison ministers. There were prophets who came in the jail and prophesied over us. I mean, it was like, I was liking it, except the, 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 the risk of getting, you know, beat up um, at night. Um, but I mean, I studied the Bible day and night. And uh, but, you know, by the time I got out, I had a pretty good foundation on, on the gospel. Um, uh, you know, the John, the, at least God loves me, but that was the story. And I, and then, you know, I was, I was set to go to prison for 10 years and I actually had peace about it. That's what makes no sense. You know, scripture says, you know, we, you know, cast our cares on him because he cares for us and pray, ask the Lord, he'll give you the peace of God that passes all understanding. I didn't want to go to prison for 10 years, but I said, well, you know, I had peace. It was crazy. So how long were you in jail for? 40 days. 40 days. Wow. So you said that there was a risk of you getting beat up in the middle of the night because that's what a lot of people fear. Did you get beat up at all in jail? (sighs) No, because I I had a strategy. I told you I was slick. I I was like Jacob. Before I got saved, I was like Jacob. So... What I did was I traded all my food for protection. So nobody wanted milk, but I, so I kept the milk. That's how I survived was drinking the milk and I gave them all my food. So I basically, I had a bodyguard and also had a maid and you can have these things. John, I'm not even kidding. I had somebody that, that, that washed my clothes. I had somebody that, 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 I know it sounds funny. How did you get that Protect. Um, you know, I, I didn't have commissary that you get commissary. So I had, I, my parents put money in my account and then you could buy commissary and you, you get the three meals a day. So I would give them their food and I would give them the commissary and, um, you know, red hots and crackers and chips and all these things. But I lost 50 pounds in 40 days and they, I looked so different that I, I needed to lose 50 pounds. Um, but I looked so different that they didn't believe it was the same person. So they, they actually fingerprinted me before I, um, before they let me out to make sure I was really me. What? But wow. other people did get beat up. Other people did get beat up wow. they, uh, often. So I stayed up all night, even though I had a bodyguard because the bodyguard fell asleep. So I didn't feel like I got a real good deal on that, but <laughs> you know, anyway. So now you are saved. Okay. And you mm-hmm. said you didn't just get, you know, minutely saved. You got radically saved how did you get radically saved i mean it's not just the you know okay i love jesus now what made you dive deep into knowing god the way that you know him i you know i just like a light went on you know like everything just made sense they gave me the scripture and they the, the, the some of the ladies would come in and they were telling miracle stories and and you know multiplication food stories and all these things and i'm like wow you know i mean i just really i i I, you know i was on sid roth many years ago we told a little little tiny bit of the story but i really believe that god gave me the gift of faith because there was no way i could have gotten out on the 40th day they wouldn't let me out with bail they wouldn't let me out with an ankle bracelet on home arrest there was no there was no possible way but the lord just started speaking to me from the time I got saved, he, I didn't know that everybody didn't hear the Lord that way. I mean, he just talking to me, talking to me, talking to me, and I'd write it down and everything he told me would come to pass. And I just, I saw him as a real person, you know, even though I couldn't see him, I could hear him. I could feel him. You know, I just believed it, it was, I, I don't know. I mean, it was a real conversion. I think some people, they say yes, and they fill up the card, but there's no heart change. I just got radically saved. And when I got out of jail, I'll tell you, my parents were not pleased. Um, you know, they were not happy. They, they, they thought it was jailhouse religion and it would wear off in a few weeks. And it was a difficult time after I got that. Cause you know, I had to go back and live with them and it was a very tense, just like when I was growing up, all brought back all those memories. And, um, but because this time I had Jesus, I was able to sustain it. But God is, he is good. And he has done so much for me. You know, 
he's done everything for me. I mean, I, 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 I'd be lost without him, not just literally, but figuratively. I don't know what I'd do without the Lord. That's so true. And you know what? My mind goes back to when you said you were in jail for 40 days. 40 days is such an important number, 40 in general. Could you just touch on really quickly the importance of 40 days? Because you were locked up in jail for 40 days and you were freed on the 40th day. So could you tell us the yeah. importance of 40? Yeah. So guys, for more of that 40 day story, go watch the film at jenniferleclair.org slash vindicated. But 40 is it. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. So that jail time was my pre-salvation wilderness experience. Actually, part of the time I was in jail, I, I was saved. And part of the time I wasn't. About halfway through, I got saved. Uh, 40, you know, the, the water uh, on the earth, 40 days. Um, the Israelites were in the wilderness 40 years. The number 40 is significant of tests and trials. And, you know, that's what I was going through. God was was it was the trial of my life quite frankly it was a trial that started you know really when my husband abandoned the family and you know culminated with my salvation so that that year and a half or so it was just a it was a hard time and man i had all the money that i could ever want i was making tons of money in my career i had a lot of money saved i'd saved like you know seventy thousand dollars at a young age but I was miserable. You know, money is not the answer. Money is money answers all things, of course, in Ecclesiastes, but money can't buy you love. But that trial that I went through, it was so severe that I was just so grateful when Jesus modeled himself as the way of escape. And he was the way of escape. He was and is still my vindicator. I'll tell you, vindication is the story of my life. I really honestly rejoice when people do me dirty because I know that vindication is coming. I've, 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 I won't say I've mastered it, but I've learned so much about how to respond when we're, when we're wronged, man, I know what to do. I know how to respond and God gives me grace to do it. And every time someone does me dirty, I mean, God just continues to elevate me and he'll do the same for all of you. You know what? That's really good because there's a lot of people who want to vindicate on their own, but what would you say to those people who have been done wrong? They've been done wrong and they want to fight back, right? They want God to do it. They trust God to do it, but they don't know whether if they should take any action or just do absolutely nothing. What would you say? Well, doing nothing is better than doing something that God tells you not to do. Scripture says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. This is the way I look at it. And I and in the book, there's keys to seeing God's justice in every area of your life. It's called Vindicated. Um, so the book doesn't really tell my life story. The movie tells my life story, but the book tells you how to respond. And I was just preaching on this yesterday at my church in South Florida, Awakening House of Prayer. And I said, something popped out of my mouth by the Holy Ghost and it was so good. I was talking about this guy that just recently, I found out he was stealing from the, from the ministry. He was overcharging the ministry about a thousand percent for a particular product. And I found out about it and I was showing them how I was walking through this particular incident right now as a real life example, didn't tell them who he was. No one would know who he is, but, you know, and I said, I said, I could go to all his other clients who are also my friends, some of them. I mean, he has lots of clients and I could say, how much is he charging you for this right here? Cause he, he, he was charging me a thousand percent more. And I could go to all these people and he would lose half of his business. I said, but I'm not going to do that because I'm not looking to get even. See, so many people are looking to get even. And I said, I'm not trying to, I'm not looking to get even. I'm looking for the sevenfold return. I'm looking for the double for my trouble. I'm looking for the triple for my trial. And I might get even doing things my way. I might take vengeance into my own hands. I might, you know, trash his name all over the body of Christ. I can do all that and I'd be getting even. But you know what I'd also be doing? I'd be sowing seeds. And those seeds would be against the word of God. I would be in rebellion. I would be defying scripture. I would be cutting off something greater that God wants to give me. He takes it personally when people do us wrong. He doesn't like it. 
he does not like it. It is not his will. He hate, He is the God of justice. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne, and he does not like it. But he wants you and me to trust him enough to put that in his hands and say, Lord, I'm going to resist the temptation. I'm going to pray for these people. You tell me, pray for those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to do it your way, God. I mean, I've been slandered. I've been lied from. I've been abandoned. I've been falsely accused of a crime I didn't commit. I've been, you know, I mean, tick down the boxes. It's all in the book. I've, I've met with all kinds of injustice, but I've also met with all kinds of vindication, relational vindication, financial vindication, all of it. God wants to vindicate all of it. And if you'll back up, listen, if you can't bring yourself to do what God says to do, at least don't do anything until the thing calms down. Don't take it into your own hands because you're tying his hands, man. And, and, and you, you and then you're going to get mad at God because he's not vindicating you when he wants to. Victim mentality, you got to avoid it. Could you touch on one more time what you just mentioned? Because it may have slipped through some people's ears when you said his hands are tied. So what happens if you do the vindication without God? without God doing it. Well, then you've got your vindication. You know how scripture says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Don't, don't, don't give to be seen by men. Don't, don't fast and pray and do all that. Whatever we do our way, God says, Oh, if that's good enough for you, you know, you, you, you can do that. We're free. We have a free will. But when we defy scripture, when we don't follow the biblical pattern for vindication, which <laughs> Jennifer, there are so many stories. Vindication is a theme line, a storyline throughout the Bible. There's a reason for that. There's a reason why God spent so much time showing us vindication. But if you see the people who are vindicated, like Joseph and David, they did not take matters into their own hands. It ties God's hands because he's, he's saying, you don't want to do it my way. So you can do it your way, but then you can't have my way. And my ways are higher. My ways are better. My ways are for more, you know, I don't want to get even. I'm looking for the sevenfold return. And, and I keep getting it. I, God keeps elevating me. I mean, we're in a hundred nations now. Come on. It, it, I, that, that can only be God. So basically what you said is if you take matters into your own hands, you've already got your, you've already got your you vindication, got it. but it's not good vindication. But when God vindicates, he knows how to vindicate and he vindicates good. And you're blessed. I mean, substantially because of it. Yep. You got it. That's the bottom line. We got to do it his way. He got to do it his way. You can do it your way, but you won't like the results. That's so true. So what is vindication? Because people are hearing it now and some people, you know, maybe piecing it together if they don't know what that word means. Could you explain what is vindication? Vindication is another word for seeing justice. And we all face injustice. You know, I think my story with the police brutality um, resonates with a lot of people because we've seen so much of that, especially against people of color. Um, you don't typically see a white, red-haired woman beat up by the cops. But that just proves, you know, that the enemy is no respecter of persons, you know, just like God is no respecter of persons. And so I, I don't know what it's like to face some of the things other people are facing. Some people have had a loved one dying of cancer. A doctor had malpractice and Oh, but but I do know what it's like to be wronged. I know what it's like to be slandered. I know what it's like to face thieves and robbery. And we want justice, but God is the judge. And we have to sometimes wait on his, he's already given the verdict, but see, he's working things out behind the scenes. I mean, you know, Jennifer, if I told you, um, if you'll, I'll give you a thousand dollars today, but if you'll wait a year, I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars. A lot of people would take the thousand dollars because they don't trust that I would give them the hundred thousand dollars. We we have to trust that God will give us what He said He'll give us, and Scripture tells us He'll give us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for for mourning, the garment of praise. He will make it better. He will take what the enemy. So so He'll give you justice, but sometimes we have to wait. And why do we have to wait? I believe. One of the reasons we have to sometimes wait longer than we want is because God wants to work something out in us. He wants us to forgive. If we don't forgive, you cannot be vindicated. Bottom line, if you do not forgive, you are forfeiting your vindication. You won't get it. You'll never get it. So you got to do it his way. But the good news is he's not trying to hold back your vindication. He's just working things out. Sometimes he has to work through people to get things, certain things restored to you. Relationships, for example, and God's working on their hearts. And so 
Vindication is essentially justice. God is our vindicator. He's our delivery. He's our protector. He's our everything. Whatever you need, it's in him. And if we'll wait on him and, and stand on his promises by faith and walk in his word, man, even while you're waiting, you can have joy and peace. You really can. So how do you resist that temptation to vindicate yourself saying, oh, I'll do it good. Oh, th- I'll do it this way. And I don't want God to do it. But how do you resist that? Whew. Uh, when I first, before I was saved, I, 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 I had a scheme to get that, to, to get everybody back. Man, I was going after all of them. Let me listen as quick as I get out of this jail. They're all going down. I mean, I had a scheme. I was a schemer, but once you've tasted vindication once, see, faith comes by hearing, but trust comes by experience. So it's good to build your faith for vindication. And the book Vindicated will do that. The film, my testimony is going to just shake you up in a good way. But it can be hard at first to trust God for vindication, especially if you've been wronged and wronged and wronged and never seen vindication. But I mean, here's the thing. If we trust him for our salvation, (laughs) then we can trust him for our vindication. How can you say you trust him for, for your eternal life, but you can't wait on him to make the wrong things right? It, we have to put it into perspective. He, he is not a man that he should lie. He's a good father. If he gave his only begotten son, he let him die on a cross. What more won't he give us? But he doesn't give us everything immediately. We have to trust him. He wants relationship. He wants to work things out of us and work things in us so that he can work things through us. We just have to wait on the Lord. It's, it's hard. But it gets easier. Like I said, when people do me dirty, like this guy that's overcharging me, I mean, he he stole a lot of money. It didn't even, I didn't even get upset. Number one, it's not my money. It's God's money. Number two, you know, I've been through this so many times. And at this point, I know God's going to do something. He's going to give me something I hasn't seen or ear heard. And, and he'll do it for you. He's going to do it for you. Just wait on the Lord. Be patient. He was patient with you. Be patient with him. So what is the blueprint for vindication? Because of course, you're not going to put it into your own hands, right? Now we agree. We're not going to put it into our own hands. We're going to trust the Lord. What is the blueprint for allowing God to vindicate those who have done us wrong? The enemy who has done us wrong. Yeah. So I spent like 220 pages talking about this, but I'm going to boil it down. I can't unpack it in the time we have left, but I'm going to boil it down because this is so important. It starts with forgiveness. Okay. It has to start with God's not even hearing your prayers if you don't forgive. Right. Scripture says he doesn't hear our prayers if we don't forgive. So it starts with forgiveness. But then God says to do a few other things. He says to bless those who curse you. Now, curse means to speak ill of. You could, if somebody steals from you, you know, you could feel like you've been cursed. Pray for those who despitefully use you. That's the baseline, that's the blueprint. You know, I could go deeper than that, but forgive, pray for them, ask God to forgive them, show mercy on them. Don't speak ill about them. Don't expose them. Keep it between you and God and get rid of that victim mentality. You really, I got a whole chapter on the signs of the victim mentality because it is so critical. Many people, I just taught this in my church yesterday. And I taught, and I mean, it must have been 20 people. I said, if you have a victim mentality, it, it, based on what I've taught you, now you see it. Now, like 20 people came up and I know there was more, but they, you know, people are too proud to admit that they have a victim mentality. But at least 20 people came up and said, yeah, based on your teaching, I saw it. I didn't see it before, but I saw it. You got to get rid of the victim mentality. You got to forgive. If you had, to, if you only heard two things out of everything I said today, if you'll do those two things, you'll be well on your way. That is good. And could you say those two things one more time? Yeah. Forgive and shed that victim mentality. That is so good. And if you do that, that'll begin to change everything. That'll begin. God will show you more what to do. He'll show you how to pray. He'll, he'll show you sometimes. He'll show you to, to sow a seed. Um, maybe you were stolen from and God is telling you to sow a seed. And you're like, they stole from me. Why you wanted me to sow a seed over here at, You got to follow God's instructions. God may give you very specific instructions on what he wants you to do to unlock that vindication. Follow whatever he tells you. I've got principles that are laid out in the book, but there could be things that God tells you that are unique to you that he wants you to do. And and many times it's part of your healing or it's part of your, your spiritual growth. 
That's good. Okay. So now you go deep with a lot of things. We mentioned that earlier. Now the courts of heaven, you say that we can actually take this vindication to the courts of heaven. But one, a lot of Christians, especially in the Western world, don't even know that you can access the courts of heaven. Or if they hear it, it sounds weird to them because they weren't taught that in the church. How does one even go or enter into the courts of heaven to begin with? Well, that's a great question. I taught a whole series on this um, on my school, School of the Spirit. But there's a chapter in the book. Think about how you go into a court of law, right? Um, I used to go into courts all the time as a journalist. So, but when you go to the court of law, you address the judge as your honor, right? You go with the proper attire. So we want to go into the courts of heaven. We want to repent. But anytime we go into any kind of warfare prayer, we want to repent first because we have fallen short of the glory of God. We don't remember everything we did wrong. So we don't want the enemy to have anything against us. So we repent. We want to take responsibility. Listen, if you married the wrong person, Guess what? You're part of the problem. You might need vindication because they took everything in the divorce. You made the choice and God may have tried to warn you. So you need to repent, right? We don't need to just point the blame, finger of blame everywhere. We want to take responsibility for our part. Say, Lord, you know, like with this guy that stole all this money from me, Lord, I should have checked to see how much that, that costs. I trusted him because I'd worked with him for a long time. That's my responsibility. I repent. I positioned myself for him to steal your money and and i repent so now i've I've repented i go into the court lord i thank you that you are a just judge you thank him acknowledge him he is the judge he's a just judge acknowledge him thank you lord that you're a just judge thank you for hearing my cries And, and and in the name of jesus i ask you lord to give me justice luke 18 the widow that went to the unjust judge and got justice lord give me justice for my adversaries you know lord you know Give me justice from my adversaries. You ask God for justice. And if you've repented and taken responsibility for your part and you ask God for justice, he's a just God. He'll give you justice. But again, so many people are under the are under the false misconception that yeah, it's going to happen. They're going to come out of the prayer closet and it's going to be done. Sometimes it's that way. I've seen 24 hour vindication. Literally, I've seen a vindication within an hour, but I've also seen vindication take years. So the timing is up to God. The, the rules of, the, of his court, we are to follow the protocols. We address him respectfully. We address him as the judge. We present our case. You know, we've repented and we ask God for justice. Many people, I'm telling you, Jennifer, many people out there listening to me, they've never even asked God for justice. They're just mad. And they, they've, never even, they've never even said, Lord, avenge me of my enemies. They, they've never... They've never even thought to ask God, right? They're just, they got a chip on their shoulder and they're mad and they're mad at everybody else. They're mad at themselves. They're mad at God. And that's not going to get you anywhere. The courts of heaven are real. It's in scripture. We don't have time to unpack all those scriptures, but it is real over and over and over. It talks about the courts and it talks about the judge and he's a just judge. And if you'll approach him with repentance and you'll ask him, he'll do it, but it's his timing. And like you said, a lot of people are just mad. They get so mad that they forget or they don't even think to ask yeah, God yeah. to fix this, vindicate me for this, you yeah. know? So yeah. that's actually really good. Now, how does one actually get to the court's room of heaven? Do they pray? Like, do they get in a prayer room? Do they meditate on the word, on the Lord? How do they enter in? Mm-hmm. So the courts of heaven, as Robert Henderson, he was really a, a breakthrough guy in this realm it's a dimension of prayer. So it's, it's a, it's a type of prayer. It's not, uh, it's not warfare prayer. It's, it's a justice seeking prayer. So we're, so God is father, he's friend, but he's also judge, right? She said, I call you friends. We know he's father, you know, we know he's a judge. Um, and so you approach the judge different than you approach the friend, right? When you approach God as friend, you're approaching him as an intercessor, right? You, you're, you're asking your friend to do something for another friend. When you approach him as father, that's when you're petitioning him for your daily bread. When you approach him as judge is when you're looking for uh, justice. So it's, it's a realm of prayer, and it's knowing that you know, God has many facets, right? He, he's, he's, he's got many names, doesn't he? He's the light of the tribe of Judah. He's El Shaddai. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's uh, the, the spotless lamb. And so 
you know, so many facets. That's why in the book of Revelation, the elders, they get a glimpse of God, the, 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 the 24 living creatures, the 24 living creatures cry, holy, 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 because they keep seeing new parts of God. So we approach, we want to approach him in the right way. So you're approaching God as judge, knowing that he is literally in, in the courtroom of heaven and literally going to hear your case. Now, here's the thing. The reason why you need to repent is because you have an adversary, the devil, and he will bring to the Lord, well, you know, they were unjust toward this person over here. They stole money over it. Oh, oh, oh. Listen, if we're stealing and we're thieving and we're lying and we're accusing and we're judging and we're doing all those things, we're not going to get justice. We need to repent of all that. Not just taking responsibility for what we did wrong in the situation that we find ourselves in which we need justice. But listen, if you, you have to first look and say, have, am I sowing, am I sowing, a, 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 am I reaping a harvest on a seed I sowed? Did I gossip about somebody else? Did I slander somebody else? Did I betray somebody else? <laughs> is this a seed I'm reaping a harvest on? Or is this somebody else sowing this into my life? And you you need to be clean before you go to the judge because you have a devil, you have an adversary, and he's going to accuse you. He's called the accuser of the brethren. So if you've done the same thing to somebody else that you're seeking justice for, and you haven't repented for that thing you did to somebody else, but yet you want justice because somebody did it to you, uh-uh, not going to work. The enemy's going to say, that's not they didn't confess that they didn't they didn't clean that they, they're, they're dirty in that realm it's real so you keep using the word repent a lot of people don't know what that means a lot of people just say you know or think it it means i'm sorry but what does repent mean when you say go to the lord repent for this go to the lord repent for that what does that actually mean the greek word for repent is montaneo which means to turn the other direction to think in a whole new manner so we're, we're turning away from the wrong thoughts that led to the wrong behavior because everything we do is, you know, we think it before we do it. So we're turning away. We're acknowledging that that's not the right way. That's not God's way. That's not God's thoughts. That's, that's, that's not how God wants me to be. So I'm turning now away from that and I'm going to walk back in God's way. And I'm, I'm renouncing that. And I'm, I'm repenting before the Lord. You renounce the enemy work, the enemy's work. You repent before the Lord and you choose a better way. And will you fall and make the same mistake again with something? Yeah, you'll keep, you'll, but if you keep, you know, Lord, help me to turn, give me the grace. Um, it's not like wailing and being condemned and crying. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God's not mad at you. He's not condemning you. He loves you. You're a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. He's one with you. Um, but it isn't like everything we do. So we, we want to continually grow in the grace of Christ. And part of how we do that is through repentance. So before we end this, though, there's one thing we didn't touch on really quickly. And I'm sure yeah. if any of you listening to this, I know that you're going to want to read Jennifer's book, Vindication, and watch this movie because there's Colombian drug lords involved. And Jennifer got wrapped up with this. Jennifer, could you just give us a little <laughs> nugget on the drug lords and what happened there? Yeah. So when my husband left and I, my divorce attorney said, you have a warrant for your arrest. Uh, she said, you better get out of that apartment, go somewhere. I didn't know anybody really. And so I called this Colombian fellow that I knew. He'd been a friend with us for a while. He's actually, um, he was actually, uh, he, he sold us weed back before my daughter was born. So I contacted him and I said, listen, you know, my husband's gone. I need to get out of here. I didn't tell him why. And he connected me with this, this family. And um, I'd actually met them a few times and we'd had barbecues together and all these different things. Long story short, they came and they took me to this apartment. They put the apartment in their name. Um, they took my car. Um, they essentially kidnapped me and they made me, they wanted me to let them my ex-husband for five thousand dollars and that's when i realized if i don't let them do this they might murder me so i called a friend and um he came and <laughs> rescued me and drove me to another city and i started my life over there and and shortly after that when i got arrested and, and was facing 10 years in prison but the the movie is so rich with my testimony please watch that at jenniferleclair.org slash vindicated film the book is called vindicated jenniferleclair.org slash vindicated book. Um, the, the movie tells you my testimony, jaw dropping stuff, but it'll inspire you. And then the book sort of gives you the keys, 31 chapters. There's so much. It would take me, you know, 31 hours to, to teach it. 
but you can read it probably quicker than that. I did. I'm doing the audio book. It's in my own voice. So you'll like that as well. But um, it's been a journey and I'm, I'm so grateful for your interviewing skills. I don't normally give such long answers, but I just felt like I couldn't do it in a, in a quip. I had to, I had to expound on some of these things. So I hope, I hope that it was helpful. I really love interviewing you. And I love the fact that you're very um, transparent when, when you give your answers and you're genuine. And I really like that. And I, I love the fact that the Lord put this book on your heart, because I feel like this is a topic that a lot of people are dealing with right now, but they're really not facing it, you know? So Jennifer, mm-hmm. this is amazing. And mm-hmm. please, everyone get the book is to help you out watch the movie. And again, what is the movie called and where can they watch the movie? Cause a lot of people like to see visuals too. So where can they watch the movie? Yeah. Well, it's free to watch. You're going to go to jenniferleclair.org slash vindicated film. And uh, if you can't remember all that, just go to my website at jenniferleclair.org. And um, it's about 45 minutes. You're going to love it. I, 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 I did it originally as a tool to see Soul Saved. That was my motive in making the movie. But it'll it'll inspire you and you'll learn a lot more about me. And hopefully you'll love me even more. <laughs> I'm telling you, Jennifer, I didn't know all this about you until, <laughs> until this interview. And I'm like, oh, my word, this is amazing. <laughs> God can change anybody. He can transform a whole life. Mm-hmm. Because like I told you earlier, you know, I would follow you for about 10 years on LinkedIn. You always put things up. But I never knew that, you know, you were involved with drug lords and you, you know, married a man who went away to a different country and never came back. You just had, and you went to prison jail. I didn't know these things, but it shows that God can change anyone, anyone, whoever you are, he can put you in prison and you can help change the world. Like what you're doing right now, 100 nations, right? 100 nations. Yeah. Crazy. Wow. Yep. Awakening prayer hubs, join the movement. Amen. All right. So Jennifer, could you do one thing for us? Could you pray for everyone watching right now, how the Lord is leading you. Yes. So Father, I just thank you for all those under the sound of our voice. And I just ask you, Father, to open our eyes to your goodness and your grace. Help us, Lord, in that moment of crisis, when all hell is breaking loose against us, when we're suffering wrong, when we're hurting, when we're in pain, when we're mad, help us to remember that you are good and you are the vindicator. You're the protector, the provider. You are our everything. Lord, teach us, remind us, help us to walk down your narrow path that leads to vindication. It leads to life. It leads to healing. It leads to wholeness. It leads to everything we could ever dream of. And I bless all of those watching this broadcast. And I bless Jennifer. And I ask you, Lord, to increase her voice in the nations. I ask you, Lord, to to lift her up even higher as an uncompromised vessel, a pure voice in this hour. And I bless her family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Amen. Jennifer LeClaire, it was an honor to interview you. And I know you've touched so many people. I'm telling you, your ministry Mm -hmm. alone is just such a blessing. So again, I just want to thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate it so much. The honor is mine. If you'd like to be born again and give your life to Jesus Christ today, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and am lost without you. I'm convinced that you're my only saving grace and my only hope. No longer do I want to do life without you. I believe that you came to earth to die on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead three days later, and are coming back for me one day soon. Please come into my heart and be my Lord, Savior, and friend. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, get yourself a Bible and read it daily and ask God to interpret every word for you. Then surround yourself with like-minded believers in Jesus Christ. Congratulations and welcome to the family.